Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast. In a Week in Sports Cars special edition, we're looking back 20th anniversary of a very special Le Mans victory of a couple of dear friends here in York Bergmeister and the, all caps, Patrick Long. He is infused with air, water. Uh, he is just made of all the great, great things like the magical unicorn that he is. Guys, thanks for joining us here. We find ourselves at another point in time heading into Le Mans. Tell me about this overall, just looking back on this 20-year anniversary, that number 90 Westward Ho Casino Porsche of yours. What comes to mind before we get into some of the particulars, but 20-year milestone of getting that big first Le Mans win as teammates. I'll jump in there. I mean, first I'll say thanks for the entry. Jurg would say I'm mostly full of air um, and, <laughs> and hot air at that. But um, always great to chat with you. Always great to chat with Bergie. Um, you know, that period, 2004, obviously I have my own personal story. It was, I think, my second or third endurance race ever and first year as a factory driver for Porsche. I was definitely the late ad, the liability, and uh, Jurg was hard on me. I remember that showing up, and it was a it was a welcoming environment, a small team, a family based team, but every single player in that team, uh, led by Jurg's intensity, um, I had big shoes to fill. Uh, Sasha Mossen is our third driver, yeah. but what really kind of came to well, he was our first driver. I was the third driver, but um, what really came to mind when you sort of opened it up was. It was a period in sports car racing that was so pure and it was kind of a, an amazing transitional phase for us as a single car entry um, and the, the style of racing in 2004. It was still about getting the car home. You had to be quick, but you had to be reliable. And we all faced adversity during the race. We all spent time in the garage and I just was reflecting in how much the sport has changed, how reliable the cars and tires are now and how intense it is mentally and physically uh, to be able to go qualifying pace and just crush every single curb in sight. Um, those days, it was more of a traditional era of, of endurance racing. And I'm so grateful that I can tell all those, the older I get, the faster I was stories about kid. You don't even know what it's like to drive Le Mans with an H pattern synchro box and to go into the pits to fix a throttle cable and still come out and win. But uh, just, just great memories. Time to say a big thank you to our show partners on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, starting with FAF Technologies, build-to-print composites manufacturing company. They're specializing in medium to large-scale automotive, motorsports, and military applications. Visit faftechnologies.com. It's P-F-A-F-F technologies.com to learn more about their services and how they can benefit your business. Next, it's the Justice Brothers, makers of premium additives, lubricants and cleaners and servicing the automotive and motorsports industries for more than 85 years with victories in all the biggest North American motor races, including the Indianapolis 500, the 24 hours a day Tona, the justice brothers products are truly race proven. Learn about their vast history and range of offerings at justicebrothers.com. If you're fond of awesome motor racing collectibles, including FAF motorsports, McLaren gear and goodies, Pay a visit to torontomotorsports.com. And finally, we have a new online merchandise home for the podcast, thepruittstore.com. For all the show stickers, models, racing memorabilia I'm trying to sell and put towards our fun to buy a house is now live and rocking, thepruittstore.com. Yeah, see, you got it easy today, see. You kids don't even know, see. Back in my day when the world was black and white, <laughs> see. You're, uh, again, oh, yeah. you, you were on a, a bit of a, a rocket yourself career-wise. Tell me about, again, yeah. looking back on 20 years uh, of how this further propelled you. Well, first off, I don't remember being hot on Patrick. I was more worried about, uh, about myself on that weekend because I had a... Uh, Fairly severe bike crash the week before. Um, so uh, I landed on the hood of a car and that was actually still fairly comfortable. But due to his braking, I uh, had a nice slide on the on the tarmac and was missing quite some skin. So, <laughs> so that was was quite interesting. In interesting and um, especially 
during the test I was hurting quite badly uh, for the race actually itself it was was more or less okay but uh, wasn't sure if, if I could even race that weekend so it was was definitely uh, an eye opener that I should spend uh, more time running and less cycling. <laughs> no. I remember you're such a perfectionist and he was always performance minded still is and I remember him saying like yeah I think I will stop cycling now because it's making me too slow like it's too much time doing something not intense enough. And I was like, what about the scabs like all over your face and your limbs? Wouldn't that be enough reason to change uh, from cycling to running? But it was more about what it did for lap time. Oh, that, of is, that is so brilliant. You guys are mental, but I love you guys. So we're talking about the, the, the 70 second running of the 24 hours of Le Mans. That was June 13, 2004. This gorgeous Porsche 911 GT3 RSR, as you mentioned, you too, Sasha Mason as well. Talk about some characters here, right, with this team. And for those who who either weren't alive back then or, or don't know about such things, definitely go back and spend a little bit of time on YouTube. This White Lightning team, uh, run by Dale White, one of the great characters of the world, uh, Michael Peterson, that is a man who knew and knows how to have fun in life. Engineer Harry Haggard, the great Stefan Pfeiffer there as crew chief. Uh, Kent Moore as lead tech. This was not a full factory straight uh, from Porsche program. This was a high achieving privateer effort coming over from America this is their first time running Le Mans independently. It had been there uh, one time prior with help from the amazing Alex Joe. But this was a big achievement, guys, for White Lightning Racing coming over to Le Mans as a standalone group. Uh, this is an era where that could happen, where a small team like this or a, a non-factory team could go across the Atlantic and rock up in Le Mans and have a proper chance of doing well. Patrick, why don't you tell me a little bit about that side? Because it's very different from today where seemingly every team in the GT categories, if not every category at Le Mans, uh, comes across almost like it is a pure factory deal. Yeah, it really was a melting pot of personalities and talent. Um, when you think about the driver lineup of this car, you know, Sasha and Jurg, Correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you guys were coming from the Alex Job sort of works-assisted works uh, IMSA team and and really the guys to beat. I was uh, coming from TRG, just getting my toe wet in ALMS for the first year. Um, none of us were regular drivers for Peterson, but Peterson had shown so much promise as sort of a, a customer team in the U.S. And it really was a, a, a high intensity, high focus caliber organization led and, and overwatched by Roland Kuzma, who is one of the biggest names mm. in all of Porsche motorsport history, as far as I'm concerned. And so when I walked in, the first face that I met was Stefan Pfeiffer and Stefan deserves his own show. So I'm not going to ramble on about mm. all these characters, but let's just say they were all all stars from different walks of life. If you look at Dale White leading the organization from the desert racing side, Stefan Pfeiffer coming from AMG ITC days, as well as uh, Cal Wells and the MCI IndyCar days. Um, there were there were all stars all the way down the line through every mechanic. These guys were still in touch with a lot of these mechanics. They run their own shops. They have their own brands. Um, but Tim from BBI, Joey Seely from Emotion. Um, there were there were so many walks of life. Harry Haggard was a guy at that time he would have been in his his 70s and he had worked and owned 904s he became a lifelong friend of mine RIP he's just one of my favorite humans in the world so I was meeting most everybody for the first time I had known Sasha and Jurg for about a year um, but I had never driven with them so it quickly became apparent that it was lean it was mean it was uh, work hard and play hard it was a family organization where when the radios and the headsets went on, it was as organized and militant as any organization I'd ever worked with. But when the session was over, you know, we were we were friends. And if you didn't last on the social side, you weren't going to be there on the performance <laughs> side because 
Dale really, we, he led from the top that this was a family and there was respect. There was oftentimes um, tough conversations, but we always closed down Vanessa's when we won later on in this storyline in the years afterwards. When we won a race, we were literally dancing on tables. So it very much was a <laughs> no, plan. No, you were. <laughs> Stuttgart, Stuttgart meets Vegas and, and everything in between. And that's what I was going to lead into here with you, Jorg. Knowing the amazing teams you've been a part of coming into this, as Pat said, this was as diverse a group, folks coming from every area of the sport. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that's actually a problem, and folks are too different to find that common bond. Tell me what you found. As Pat said, the Las Vegas meeting, Stuttgart, uh, this was a team that liked to have fun. This is a team that saw the bigger picture in life beyond racing. But, yeah, when it was time to flip down that visor, hardcore racers. Tell me about the culture here. Yeah, for me, I think um, one of the key people was definitely Stefan Pfeiffer. I talked already before that one-off race in Le Mans to him quite a bit. Um, Just a super likable guy, but also all in when it comes to racing. And I think um, knowing what he is like and then obviously getting to know the rest of the team as well, um at a one-off race it, it's you don't get to know everyone in person and and really closely that obviously happened later on um yeah but especially with sasha being like the seniority uh, on the driver crew i'd say um he obviously um had a lot of experience on how to build up teams and uh, how we should approach the weekend was also also only my third uh, le mans weekend uh, race if i'm not wrong i think yeah third one um, so not a whole lot of ex- experience there, but a little bit, at least more than Patrick. <laughs> but Sasha was definitely uh, the team leader, I'd say, and um, therefore heads off to his work. And as I said, for me, it was all about surviving and being able to race um, was for me already uh, was happy that I could do that. Um, and then obviously winning the race was something yeah, i never forget again. Uh, it was really cool being on the podium on the top step as one of the coolest memories you can have in, in racing in Le Mans. Pat, I'd love to hear your memories of your first Le Mans, whether it's showing up for scrutineering photos, not as if you hadn't seen or been to some big and impressive motor races in your life before, but tell me about uh, year one for you at Le Mans and kind of working into this seeing the pageantry, you can feel the provenance the moment you get there. But what was it like for you uh, as a kid, wide-eyed, stepping into this world? Yeah, so many memories. Um, To summarize, I remember, uh, obviously, we're leading and we're going into the race. It's a a late call I get from Uwe Bredel maybe a week before the pretest that said, hey, what are you doing on the first weekend of June? And I'm thinking to myself, going to the gym, filling up days with nothing. Um, I'm ready. Um, And uh, he said, well, get on a plane and I'll tell you the rest later. So I flew in 11th hour. I don't know who I was filling in for, but clearly something slipped through the cracks and I was, I was in. And I remember, you know, no simulators, no even video games with Lamar licenses that I knew of. So the first time I saw the track, I couldn't get over the sheer amount of speed, the average speed of how fast we were going and how narrow it felt. And I remember like after my first session of just getting my 10 laps in as a rookie, I was like 20 seconds off the pace and thinking to myself, I don't know how I'm going to close this gap because I'm already freaked out. Um, But, you know, Sasha and Jörg, you know, Jörg was nursing his wounds that we've already discussed, but Sasha really kept me calm and he was such a great mentor and he really was already um, in the place that he is today, which is being a mental mindset type coach, a guy that distills down all the noise and is sort of that guru Yoda that just just kind of puts his arm on your shoulder and, and smiles in his German Belgian chuckle and says, you'll be fine. Um, And he was like that all the way to the final stint when it was my rotation, just how yellows and everything else fell. And I looked at him and said, 
dude, I'm exhausted. We're leading this race. I'm not ready to get back in the car and bring this thing across the line. I'm, you know, 21 years old and you got to take this for me. And he looked at me and he was kind of initially pissed off because no one wants an extra hour at the end of a 24 hour race. <laughs> but he said, I like that. I like that you have the humility to basically say, I'm not ready for this and you got to take it across the line. So that was the working relationship uh, with Sasha that that meant a lot to me as a junior. And and that's nothing to take away from what Jörg provided to me and what we really did in the years afterwards, where Jörg taught me so much about the mindset of racing, but also, also about the technical side. But no, I mean, to back up, I lived in Le Mans in 1999 as part of the La Filiere Elf program. Yep. That was a scholarship program that, you know, Servia went through, Bordet went through, uh, Garcia, the list of names. So I knew my way around the town. I saw the race for my first time in 99. I was standing in the pits when Dumbreck went upside down. So like Le Mans had been burned in my mind that this was a race I one day hoped to get to. Um, I only dreamt of it. And when I went there to visit in 2003 and to sort of observe with Mike Rockefeller, I thought one day, maybe five or six years down the line, I will get a shot if I really play my cards right and keep the car on the track and, and keep my status as a works driver. I never, ever envisioned that 12 months later, I would be walking out onto the top step of the podium of one of the biggest races in the world. And it all felt very overwhelming, very fatiguing. And it was almost too good to be true. I remember waking up Monday morning at a hotel in Paris and, and looking at the newspaper and thinking to myself, holy f bomb like this did happen that's phenomenal Jorg, why don't you help us start to get into on track activity i know that when we get to qualifying oh, there's a, a pretty magical lap delivered by sasha but tell me about getting on track with uh, the this new trio uh, that you're a part of and obviously you and sasha uh very well connected but Tell me, about, tell me about getting on track and what those initial practice sessions were like. Well, it's been a long time, so. <laughs> um, I think we did, um, in the practice sessions, obviously, it was um, on the test day, it was important that Patrick gets his mandatory laps in. Um, that was obviously one of the main focuses that we had to achieve. Um, but then working with Stefan on setup and... Um, I think in, in pre-qualifying, if I'm not mistaken, we were quickest. Um, so it wasn't, was all looking pretty good. And just looking at the driver lineup, uh, it was pretty clear that we should have a shot at the, at the win. Um, but obviously at the time, as Patrick mentioned, uh, usually you were running uh, H-pattern box. And then only for the race, we switched to the brand new six, uh, sequential box. And um, obviously taking a little bit of risk, but we, we felt it's worth taking it um, because with the, with the H pattern, you really had to nurse the, the gearbox for the 24 hour races. Um, so went, uh, did a did a rollout on the airfield the night before, um, ran in the, the engine and the gearbox. Yeah, and then the race started. Well, the, and I wanted to park there for just a moment. So Sasha... Uh, chucks the car into pole. Um, yes. Wonderful, wonderful effort there. I know I can at least refer back to like my days in IndyCar in the Indy 500, where we had qualified second in 1998 as a very small privateer team, TKM Genoa, with Greg Ray as our driver. We should not have been there. We should have been at the back. But we, again, miracles happened. We qualified second. Someone within the team, a vendor, said, hey, we have this new, we have these new gears, right, that are slightly lighter, but they're stronger than the standard gears that you would use in the car. We think this will give us an advantage in the race. Uh, why don't we try them? To which us being in our second year said, yeah, that sounds great. It was the dumbest decision we ever made. They sure as hell weren't as strong as the originals. We should have kept the originals, but leading into the race, we decided to go with this new and 
somewhat untried technology, we broke all the gears. Uh, we were out after 18 laps. It was a huge, huge crushing thing. Our own stupidity. I'm not saying Porsche did not put in a million hours getting, testing, making sure that this new sequential gearbox was perfect to go racing. But that was the first thing that came to mind of like, you're on pole, things are going well, let's try something radically new for the race. <laughs> what? What are you doing? <laughs> I think that Roland Kuzma was one of the guys really pushing for the gearbox uh, because obviously it's one thing <laughs> trying it and testing um, and putting a race distance on it. So um, Roland was always good for taking a gamble and um, obviously that's why he was successful. Uh, he never played it safe. Um, luckily it worked out, I'd say. Pat, tell me about this experience because again, Le Mans, huge thing. You've been hoping for it. Did you have in the back of your mind, oh, yeah, night before the race, engine gearbox change, and we're rolling off to some little airfield to fly up and down and make sure everything works? Like, we would do that at a club race. If we were going to the 25 hours of Thunder Hill, that'd make total sense. I don't know if that would be what you'd expect in your very first 24 hours of Le Mans. Yeah, I echo what Jurg said. Um, I never questioned Roland Kuzma. That guy still... If he speaks, we listen. Uh, he was one of the very few that I ever worked with that could back up his reasons, not only in the engineering side and in the Intel side of everything that was happening at Vysock then. It was a small place, and Roland could touch all four walls, and, and he knew it was up. And, you know, he was a driver, so he could kind of calm your nerves. I don't remember thinking much other than, couldn't we have done this, like, with one day to go in qualifying so we could get a little head start on it. Um, but I remember just thinking, this is not your place to ask questions. Just get in and shut up and drive, which is often what I preach to our, our young lions in the Porsche uh, junior <laughs> development program. Um, I remember him also, it was a hot weekend and he put the side windows in for the race. And I was thinking, man, I'm like already hanging on here for 40 <laughs> minutes in the car. And now he's putting the side windows in, but that was Roland. He was going to win. He would rather break on the first lap than finish second. And I loved that about him. And it, it just resonated for me in the rest of my career. Um, I will mention on the gearbox side that it felt pretty good. And I had never driven one until my first stint in the race. And um, I did kind of drop the bag Um sort of second day when the sun came up in the race, I think we were leading your, your definitely remembers this cause I fricked it up, but I was going into Tetra Rouge and I downshifted and probably didn't hit the gearbox hard enough and got sort of a false neutral between the gears and the rookie and me went for, went for another hard hit on the gearbox. So I got two downshifts, locked the rear, sunk the thing in the gravel, had to wait the, panic mode of the tractor showing up to drag me back on the track i mean it was a walk of shame for me uh we were fortunately able to battle back uh, and overtake the freisinger car that we were battling so hard with which had ortelli and rama in it and we were just trading the lead with them i i remember it it's probably not accurate but i remember the second half of the race just being in a knockdown drag out with those two um, in, in that car. And, and it was a battle to the end. And, and all of us had, uh, other parts of, of slip ups with throttle cables and, and clutch cables and things like that. So it was just a old school brawl, uh, all the way to the finish. And I remember Rama afterwards, I saw him in mid Ohio the weekend later. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you got lucky. Uh, I, I had this win in the bag. And he was like, still talking, still talking crap the week <laughs> after, but, um, no, it's it fun. Good old Romaine dumbass. Gotta love that guy. Jorg, this, uh, this also, uh, for modern fans of Le Mans, coming back to the, the very different way the race was run, today you have the slightest misstep. Might, have, might not even be your fault. Someone hits you, need to go in. If it's a prototype, maybe change the nose or whatever it is. Any little time loss today at Le Mans can seemingly end your race in terms of a chance for victory. Uh, this was a time where adversity was not totally unexpected. It was actually kind of normal for seemingly every car to have something go wrong. Y'all led the first long time of the race. 
And then you start having some of these things happen, whether it's Pat uh, paying a visit to the gravel, whether, uh, as he mentioned, um, uh, think- cable ish, throttle cable, broken shock, uh, like you guys start to get into a, some of the adversity that could set you back. Tell me about that part of the race, brother. Well, I think uh, the first bigger pit stop, we lost like 20 minutes. Uh, and that nowadays would definitely mean uh, you're done. I mean, even 2013, uh, when I was in the factory car, um, we lost the race just because on the very first initial safety car, we dropped back to the second safety car and lost a minute. And that decided the race already. So yeah. uh, in those yeah. less than 10 years, the complete racing changed so much that it was a sprint race nowadays. And you're just pushing flat out, uh, which on one hand is cool, because as a driver, you always want to push as hard as you can. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it was also good that you had to keep in mind that you had to manage your equipment a little bit and make sure that you last the 24 hours. Um, and as I said, we, we had a, quite a long break. Obviously, when you're in the pits and you're losing 20 minutes, you don't really think about uh, that you have a shot at winning anymore. Um, so we just went out there and pushed as hard as we could and yeah, got back there eventually after the others were starting to get some issues and um, somehow made it at the end. Broken shock thrown in there. Y'all had multiple things you had to recover from. Pat, what do you recall in terms of, okay, yes, this is an endurance race and we do have to protect the car, save the car, but if we are going to have a chance, we also do have to kind of sort of go like hell. Yeah, I, I loved that aspect and I miss that aspect of, of modern racing. I remember my first endurance race was with Jurgen Timo a few months prior at Daytona and I remember us discussing dropping wheels on the exit of the bus stop and and that the car just wouldn't survive. So. I'm sure that those those uh, rants or lectures were directed towards me coming out of Super Cup and Career Cup, where we would just absolutely destroy the car every single weekend. And and so, yeah, I, I think that element of endurance it still was ragged edge pace, but you always had the car in your mind when you were choosing your shift point, choosing how much exit curb you took, um, thinking about the brakes. And, and then I loved that aspect of team because we did have to battle. And I remember we had a narrow little garage with some very basic walls on it, but it was still tight and rolling the car on the jacks into the, into the garage and watching the desert mentality come out of Dale White and Stefan Pfeiffer sort of overseen by Harry and, and Roland, our, our gray haired uh, masters. And everybody was so calm. Uh, our young mechanics, Nico and Joey, and and even Batim, who was there with with PM and A, uh, Kent, they all knew their place, and they had all practiced this. And I think that Dale always re- led a protocol, a mindset that we were are going to have issues, but we are going to be calmer, stronger, and more efficient than some of these these young random teams. And it was so calming. For me as a rookie, I just knew it was in the best hands. I never second guessed if stuff was tight when we rolled back out there. And it just came into this cadence where you just keep banging through your stints. You nail your laps. I remember coming down pit lane and Stefan saying calmly over the radio, you will stay in the car for another stint. And it, you know, in one way, I'm like, damn, I got another hour to go. But at the same time, Mm -hmm. there was this calming part of all of them that just, made you feel a part of a a big chain and every single link counted. And it was the most calming and motivating at the same time spirit. And yeah, I'll, I'll always cherish those, those days, but especially at Le Mans uh, where the stakes are so high and there is, there is still serious speed um, in, in, in the mindset of a driver. I think you, you raised another great point, which I haven't hit hard enough. And that is, White Lightning's off-road experience, their their background, their crazy Baja, this and that, they're accustomed to calamity being the norm. The thing showing up at the checkpoint with everything hanging off of it and fluid shooting in 20 different directions and windshields gone and you name it, it's been barrel rolled five times since they last saw it. 
in thousand degree scorching weather, no meticulous shop out in desert, dirt, sand, and having to fire in and make those repairs. What better group to have coming to Lamont for their first time as a, a truly standalone operation when adversity hits? Oh, we got to change a, a, a throttle cable? Yeah, all right. That's that's actually pretty simple. Busted shock? Yeah, hey, that's, that's really nice in this beautifully paved floor garage. This is like the lap of luxury. What a beautiful, beautiful skill set, Pat, for a team to bring into Lamont and show folks like, Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, we got this. Yeah, we were um, a pretty lean organization. I mean, Mike Peterson funded most of the team and he was all about what we needed to win, but nothing over the top. I remember we were a group of fly-ins from all facets of our different walks of life and they would prep the car in the race parking lot, kind of World of Outlaws style, there was no massive fancy shop. Um, there was no full-time. I think Dale might have been the only full-time employee in that whole organization. But he was so organized and and so understated that it just had like a, a Navy SEALs type feel to it. Mm. And I will tell you that his leadership structure was big in the efficiency, but also he set a precedent that we were there uh, to do work. And when the work was over, then we would jump up and down and party on the pit lane and, and hug and embrace. But beyond that, the suits were plain blue for the mechanics. And there were a couple patches on there writing on the inside of the cockpit where the, where the drivers could see was don't hit shit and <laughs> hi mom. And, and, and Mike was the type of guy, he was always there, uh, but he never inserted himself to a degree that that he knew his place and he was never trying to be the big man on campus. He entrusted Dale. He knew that Dale White had taken Chevy through Baja as a factory organization. And, and it just was a very light and lean organization that was all business. And when you put in someone like Stefan Pfeiffer uh, or, or Roland Kuzmal, they kind of embody the same thing. They're not about the flash. They're really about what it takes distilling it down to what makes an organization churn and what creates result in a competitive environment. And I swear to you, there's a subconscious part of it that that is nothing to do with my DNA or my upbringing that lives with me every single day through exposure to not only this organization, but to a lot of the Porsche teams that I had a chance to work inside of. And I'll always say that racing is such an education in, you know, personal and social, but really in how to operate effectively and efficiently with all walks of life and so many cultures melting into one organization. And I, I think that's so understated in motorsport. These people are, are amazing, but they're also very unique and very strong minded. And it takes a real leader and a real plan to, to have all of the people rowing in the same cadence in the same direction. Yorg, you got a big smile on your face. Tell me about this from oh, your exactly. side as well. These off-road desert people saying, okay, let's run a Porsche. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, uh, what more can you ask for, right? <laughs> They've seen it all, I guess. Um, no, but Patrick is absolutely right. Um, having guys like Stefan Pfeiffer, Roland Kusmo, um, having plenty of experience, knowing what it takes to be successful, um, and then Dale in his calm but really specific way on on how he ran the team um i think it all just grew together and uh, from the beginning on uh, there was a common understanding that there's only one goal and that's being successful and i think once you have set that tone in the team everybody is uh, marching in one direction and um, that's how you become successful ultimately let's talk about crossing that finish line and victory Give me some reactions here, some feelings, because we know, looking back 20 years later, this was the first major achievement for this Bergmeister long relationship, which would go on for so many years and become an iconic, crazy, fun thing afterwards. But uh, 
first victory for the two of you at Le Mans in your first start together. Sasha, obviously the the anchor of this, but give me your uh, your memories and reactions to holy crap, yes. poor Le Mans winner. That was exactly. I was just super excited and happy. Um, the two years before. Uh, First year I finished second with lots of uh, break issues with Freisinger, uh, also with Sasha and uh, Romain Dumas. It's not Romain Dumas. I've been um, pronouncing that wrong all these exactly. years. Gosh darn it. <laughs> I'll get that right one As of these years. Call him. <laughs> uh, so just really excited that we won it and obviously over the moon and uh, had a good night afterwards. <laughs> Pat, are you still, you're still sobering before, up from that, aren't you? I, I, I feel like that might the, be the case. But really, the most memorable moment is definitely when you're stepping on the podium, seeing all the people there. It's, it's mind blowing. Sea of humanity. Tell me about that, Pat. Yeah, I was, again, I'm kind of doubling back on my long winded commentary, but I was relieved it was over. It was still sort of surreal. I was beyond fatigued. Um, Jurg talked about it at the top before we went live. Um, I remember it that Jurg being 6'4 uh, ripped all the padding out of the Recaro seat because he said, you need to feel the car. All I know is I was sitting on a flat piece of wood and I remember sitting in the pits after the race on somebody from the team had a, a, a wife or girlfriend that had this leopard print neck pillow that I was just sitting on because my ass hurt so much from banging on that wood 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 floor of the seat with no padding and i just remember being exhausted emotionally mentally and just relieved it was over it hadn't sunk in for me but sharing the podium and and seeing all of the different winners the overall winners i mean we had the most unbelievable or i did my first my first um behind the scenes with the aco and then seeing that sea of people fill uh, below the podium at Le Mans, you just think to yourself, this might never happen again, but I am complete in my life's dreams, at least within motorsport, um, with this moment. And I just remember the the podium and embracing Stefan and Dale and, and just thinking, did we seriously just do this? Like, <laughs> we freaking did this. Like, it was unbelievable. I, you know, I, I wonder now, why all of your racing seats going forward did not have some sort of leopard print on them in honor of the <laughs> ass-saving neck pillow. Well, I just wear the silk boxers now uh, in tribute to our oh. first. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> all right, Jorg, so you come into the race, scarred up, tore <laughs> up from uh, getting uh, hit by a car on your bike. Pat, you're there on seemingly almost no notice. Uh, without the ability to do any preparation. This is, again, in an era where there was no iRacing, no simulator, no YouTube. There's no anything. You're having to rock up and learn. You're having to lean on Sasha, obviously, who's not just great behind the wheel, but also a great mental coach. You have this wacky assembly of folks from Kusmal, all-time legend. Uh, Pfeiffer, who's gone, who was already phenomenal, but has gone on to even greater things. All the mechanics, everybody you mentioned, Peterson helping to fund things, uh, Dale and his very kind of Yoda uh, Zen like way, but also man of the desert. I it, you could not write a script that put all of this together and said, and you're going to win in the end. No one would believe that, and yet you did. Is that one of the things I would imagine on top of this being your first Lamar victory? but also sits with you as like, wow, we couldn't recreate this if we tried. It was that special. It was our year. Um, we came back the year after more prepared. Uh, obviously, I felt much more comfortable, and we had a perfect race and finished second. Um, and and I, when I say perfect, we didn't miss a tire pressure by a pound, and we ran flat out. Um, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't our year because there was one car who was better than us. So, um, I learned through my next 14 starts, how hard it was to win in the GT class, uh, at Le Mans, especially as time went on. I will say that 
all of the the mixed bag of characters and the storyline of this um, casino team uh, from Vegas with these desert off road guys. It was it was made for TV, um, but it was an American team, and America Lamont obviously has such a storied past and and current. But we were up against the top European drivers and teams. Um, but I don't really remember battling in 2004 anybody uh, from home, if you will. So that was the other part that felt so amazing, you know, showing back up and going to work a week later. We all dispersed back to our regular full-time teams, but there were banners hanging up over the garages at Mid-Ohio that was congratulating the ALMS teams on winning Le Mans. And, and that felt really good coming back to the U.S., um, representing our our home home entrant country and and for me obviously being being from California so no just just again um, really fun to sort of relive this I I do admit my memory is not what I've expected it would be because I can't remember uh, all the little details but uh, just just grateful to be along for the ride and and glad that nobody voted me off the island before the weekend started for being uh, a liability. <laughs> from an experience standpoint. Jorg, why don't we close on this? So looking back now, 20 years, phenomenal stories, phenomenal results. I'd say just having been fortunate to be around the two of you for the majority of your career together, I'd say one of the greatest gifts to come from this surprise lineup at Le Mans and the success you had was this driving relationship with you and Pat, but this true brotherhood that was built that year at Le Mans and years and years after. The two of you, right? That's been one of the great gifts to the racing world. Can't imagine you knew that was going to happen back at Le Mans in June of 2004. No, for sure. Uh, didn't expect that we would be such long teammates and not even only teammates but really really close and good friends uh, so very fortunate that uh, we hit it off that well and um, I think one of the key things in our so-called driving relationship uh, there was never too much ego involved um, we always set the, the same goal and that was winning um, no matter what and if it meant that one or the other had to step back a little bit. Uh, none of us ever hesitated to do so. And um, I think that was one of the key things how we became successful together. Beautiful times. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there and say one thing. It definitely wasn't love at first sight. And we we learned how to... What? Um, we, we learned how to... Um, navigate our different backgrounds. And the irony of it that I will mention is, is that Jurg is such a like approachable, smiley, happy guy in the paddock. So if you see him from a distance, you're like, I want to meet that guy. He, he seems really friendly. And then when you're in the trenches with him, you realize like, man, this guy's like a trained assassin and he's so ready to do whatever it takes to win and he can be hard. And then I'm kind of the opposite. Again, I'm giving, giving my uh, third party um, commentary here, but like I've had a lot of people say, I saw you from a distance and you look like a prick, but you're actually okay once we're all pulling in the same direction. <laughs> so it goes back to the Wolfgang Duheimer mantra of like, there are peaches and there are coconuts. And the irony in, in that speech was that Germans are more like coconuts where they're hard on the outside and soft and sweet on the inside. I kind of say, I kind of say it's the inverse for him, him and I, for Jurg and I, we're, we're definitely opposites on paper, but when you really get to the essence of somebody and you're pulling in the same direction, that sort of overcomes what's different on paper. And then what it really distills down to is trust, loyalty, um, common properties in, in what you're setting out to do. And it's just uh, the best the best part of racing are, are the relationships. I think uh, you could tell many of those stories, Marshall. The peach and the coconut. That is the perfect <laughs> nickname Maybe for you, too. He was trying to tell me that... I'm nice from a distance, but personally, I'm a dick. Or what? I uh, no, you're you're soft and fuzzy on first touch, but when you get to your core, you're you're hard, and the center is really hard to break. 
And then for no, me, just I only think, because you needed it at times, right? <laughs> that's right. Sometimes you just need that tough nut on the middle. <laughs> I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to leave that right there. Uh, Gents, love you guys. You know that. So appreciative of spending some time, spin some yarns about a phenomenal pivot point for your careers, but also such great gifts for us, not just at Le Mans in 2004, but all the years afterwards. The uh, the Peach and the Coconut uh, documentary coming to Netflix 2026. Guys, thanks so much uh, to our pal Tom Moore as well for organizing this. Folks might not know Tom's role in public relations. PR folks are trained to be in the background, out of the spotlight, but calls like this don't just happen. It's great folks like Tom who reaches out and says, hey, you know what? Uh, There's an important anniversary coming. Want to talk with these guys and want to do something to celebrate it? Because he knows I'm a sucker for stuff like that. And I always say yes. So although we haven't heard him on the podcast, just to share that our dear friend Tom Moore uh, not only takes great care of all of us. And he was a big part of White Lightning exactly. as well. Exactly. That's where I first met him. And uh, so an evangelist for this uh, kind of homespun story as well. So thanks, y'all, for taking some time and the laughs. And glad your ass is okay, Pat. And, uh, yeah, we're going to leave the rest of that stuff alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, fellas. 